Okay, hello everybody. Uh, welcome back to our lecture series on the global history of capitalism. And in previous classes, uh, we looked at uh, some of the theoretical foundations for our investigation and discussed some of the historical origins of capitalism. And to do that, um, especially uh, I highlighted Karl Marx's Capital, Volume 1. Uh, and from, from that, um, we discussed how uh, surplus value is created, for instance. Uh, and also, uh, we looked at, in a bit of detail, uh, Marx's uh, discussion of primitive accumulation. And after that, um, we investigated this further by looking at uh, Ellen Mason's Wood uh, and her book, The Origin of Capitalism. And through her study, looked at how um, cap you know, capitalism's, uh, especially agrarian origins, um, and how it was largely a product, especially of transformed social relations, um, and that emerged uh, first in England, but then um, through market imperatives, um, you know, spread around the globe to become the dominant uh, economic system that we're in today. And from that point, now, with that as our, with those works as our basis, um, I want to investigate further by looking at some case studies of uh, how capitalism was first or early on, or was adopted early on uh, in various different places around the globe. Um, <clears throat> and we'll look at places such as China and India and how capitalism was adopted there um, in later classes. But first I want to look at uh, the history of a capitalism in Japan. And um, to do that, I'm going to look entirely at one work today, um, Noro Eitaro's uh, The Historical uh, Development of Japanese Capitalism. Um, Noro Eitaro was a pre-World War II Japanese Marxist, um, and he wrote one of the earliest, if not the first, um, studies of uh, historical studies of capitalism in Japan. So in that sense, um, in an historical sense, it's a very important work. Um, but Noro makes uh, a number of, I think, uh, very important observations, which still have great relevance today. And indeed, his work has uh, gone through numerous republications. Um, I believe the most recent one was probably sometime in the late uh, 1980s, but uh, it's, it's still in print uh, today from major publisher uh, Iwanami. Um, so it continues to have influence uh, today. So I'm going to look at this work uh, and this will be the basis for a discussion of uh, the history of capitalism in Japan. Sorry, so let me switch over to the screen here. And, <clears throat> okay. So, Noro Eitaro's The Historical Development of Japanese Capitalism, Nihon Shihon Shugi Hatatsushi. Uh, and this is just a cover of one of the most recent um, editions of the book um, put out by Iwanami. Okay, so first, just a little bit of background about Noro Eitaro. Uh, he was a Japanese Marxist historian, uh, died quite young in 1934. Um, he was uh, tortured uh, and died in prison um, by, so tortured by Japanese um, authorities. Uh, he had one leg amputated in elementary school from arthritis, and he entered Keio University School of Economics where he befriended Nosaka Sanzo. And 
um, for those of you familiar with uh, Japanese modern history, you will, I'm sure, recognize uh, Nosaka Sanzo as the founder of the Japanese Communist Party. And together uh, they formed the Nihon Gakusei Rengo, uh, or abbreviated as Gakuden. So Noto wrote the historical development of Japanese capitalism in 1926 as his graduation thesis, and that same year he was arrested uh, during the Gakuden incident, or Gakuden Jiken. Now this was the first time that the uh, Chian Ijiho, the Peace Preservation Law of 1925, had uh, been put into uh, uh, effect, and it was, it was the first time it was applied uh, actually to uh, arrest a political dissidents, anyone who, whom the state deemed as being a threat. And in this case, the first people arrested under the Chian Ijiho were uh, college students like Noto. In 19, uh, he, he was released after that, though, and in 1930, he joined the Japanese Communist Party. And then in 1932, his historical development was published as a book. Um, Noto went on to edit seven, a seven-volume lecture series on the historical development of Japanese capitalism. And this established himself as part of the Kozaha, and Koza here just means lecture, a group of pre-war Marxists. Between 1930 and 1932, he participated in anti-war movements uh, and strikes, but faced uh, he and the movement uh, faced increasing repression from authorities. In 1931, you'll remember the Japanese uh, military uh, occupied uh, parts of northern China in Manchuria, and in 1932 set up the puppet state of Manchukuo or Manchu. Um, so, period of increased militarism and uh, repression of social liberties and um, left-wing or Marxist thought. And in 1933, he was arrested and then tortured by authorities and died in prison uh, in February 1934. But his book, Historical Development, um, you know, had a, a, a lasting impact. And even uh, though he himself had a short... Uh, life, um, I, I think he's a very important uh, figure in Japanese economic history. So Noro Itaro, he's, he's concerned, of course, with the introduction of capitalism to Japan, <coughs> which is, happens in the modern era, but um, he, to set the stage for this, he looks, kind of re-examines Japanese history and Japanese economic history up to that point to show how um, previous events paved the way for Japanese capitalism. And he starts with the Taika reforms all the way back in the 7th century under Emperor Kotoku in 645. Now at this time, there were, rice fields were allocated um, to uh, people under a system called Kobuden. Um, and average people were given a small amount of land to farm, usually rice. But they also then had to pay a certain amount of tax in rice from their harvest. That surplus went to the lords and the court and whatnot. And that was the basis for all uh, national wealth and for the ruling class's power and their riches. Okay. Well, in the case of crop shortages, though, people had to borrow loans. And for farmers, this was basically forward advances on their future harvests with high interest. Or they may even be forced into slavery. Okay, but under this system, um, there, there's basically room made for private property. These are independent producers, but they give a portion of their surplus to uh, the lords. Okay, there's also a system of cultivating new fields in Japanese shikonden, where the court let people farm uncultivated lands or wilderness for free or tax-free, uh, and tax-free, and the purpose was to increase the overall produce. You know, maybe there's too many people in a certain area. Um, there's not enough rice fields to allocate in a particular area, so the court would say, okay, you need some land? Well, um, you know, you can go out on the peripheries of our um, uh, area that we rule, you know, peripheries of the kingdom or whatever. Uh, cut down some trees. We'll give you this um, barren wildland and, and see what you can do with it, right? And they didn't really think this was a big deal, but again, this as well basically allowed private property. So in theory, under the 
Taika reforms, all land was supposed to be public lands. You know, it was on lease or on loan or something. And the lords really were the owners of it, but in, in theory, but um, in reality, you know, people are working essentially as independent pro producers. Okay, so with the previous examples, we've seen that, you know, it basically allowed for what was like private property. Um, and through handing out these new lands um, through the system of Shikonden, the amount of private lands increased beyond the amount of public lands, or i.e. the centrally owned court lands. So the court thus loses more and more tax revenue because it's giving these uncultivated lands out for free. And it attempts to make up for this by raising taxes, but this leads more people to abandon the public owned land for undeveloped or untaxed private lands. So this is a pretty serious problem. This leads to some some individuals acquiring huge lands in the countryside, and these later become the large estates known as shōen. Um, and now this is where a new kind of ruling class emerges to challenge the, uh, uh, the central court. And moreover, average farmers on the shōen are basically, or were basically unfree serfs and or slaves who are now taxed by the landowners and not the central court. So those landowners themselves are basically building their own cities, right? They're getting more and more powerful. So conflict, of course, arises then between powerful Shōen families who own all the land and the wealth and the Kyoto court, uh, who increasingly owns less land and less wealth. And this leads eventually to the end of the Heian court. Um, as well as this, there was a weakening of blood ties that initially bound the ruling class together and um, this also contributed to feudalism, wherein warring factions fought against each other. So this is this transition to feudalism here in this sense means less central court control and more of these independent, separate, competing kingdoms that arose out of the Shōen system. Yeah? Meanwhile, many uh, estates or regions have agricultural serfdom, and feudalism here equals control of the land, of agriculture specifically, which is the main means of production and its labor power, who, which, is mostly, uh, which consists mostly of serfs. But this made conflict between exploited serfs and rulers inevitable. And because serfs were also exploited in other ways too, um, the agricultural produce and technology stagnated. There were no real developments or growth or so-called improvements in the field of agriculture because all of the surplus is being extracted through extra economic means through force, generally, right? So there's no motivation, no incentive um, to increase agricultural production um, or to improve it. And that, again, that's not really the aim, actually, again, because this is pre-capitalism. The aim is not to, um, it, it's not to do those things. It's not to increase, um, you know, exponentially, right? Also, commerce and industry eventually spread to the countryside, and this undermined as well the relative importance of agriculture upon which feudalism depended. So the economy at this time centered on rice, which everyone had to pay to the main capitals in either Heian or Kamakura as taxes. Um, but at the same time, the movement of this rice, the transportation of this rice, the surplus of uh, the surplus production paid as taxes, basically functioning as as money which circulates in an economy facilitates um, transport and merchants who act as middlemen. So this gives rise to a whole basically national network between these independent kingdoms of roads uh, and links them through a trade into what emerges as a basically national economy. But individual regional lords and tariffs still extracted tariffs and exchange rates on rice moving through their provinces. Because again, um, economic and political power at this time under feudalism are centralized. They're together and centralized under um, the rulers, under the daimyo. Um, so they extract their surplus and they get their wealth entirely from, um, you know, uh, uh, things like this, uh, tariffs and taxes and rice and stuff like that. So the money economy also becomes national in scope and widely used at this time. And pawnbrokers or ursers uh, increased from this time as well, but they often demanded excessive interest, which led to revolts against them and the bak bakufu, um, which variously could have been either in Kamakura or the Ashikaga shogun shogunate, um, 
And this forced the bakufu to intervene in many cases by relieving um, borrowers' debts. Um, so uh, this would be tokuseyure, um, it was called uh, in Japanese, where farmers would um, find themselves, in, you know, uh, too far in in debt um, and or too far in poverty. Um, and this threatened the entire basis uh, on which um, feudalism rested, which is the surplus wealth of, of agriculture, of the main means of production. Um, and so the bakufu in this case would forgive everyone's debts. Now, this would something like this would be almost unthinkable today if the government stepped in and forgave people's debts. On, on, but this is how um, the bakufu uh, ensured uh, control and actually prevented uh, riots and uprisings. Um, yet feudalism prevented the emergence entirely of national markets and as well as improvement or expansion of agriculture and industry. It could only expand these things through war, through extra economic means, through actually physically fighting with an enemy and grabbing their land and their means of production in the fields, right? But the focus of the Warring States era was unification, which would actually undo this feudalistic competition. So the very focus of why these different lords are competing actually works against, ironically, their own purposes. Which leads to the collapse of the feudal structure. <laughs> um, up to this point in the Tokugawa period, even when there were peasant rebellions, or called ikki, uh, there was a lack of class consciousness. And these weren't really political battles against um, the established order or the rulers, but they were more isolated events against moneylenders to relieve debt or poverty. So the Warring States uh, period was really an overthrow of the existing order and social relations. Yet Tokugawa, in the Tokugawa period, um, the Tokugawa rulers didn't do away with feudalism. So they unified, the, the state then was unified under Tokugawa rulers putting an end to the Warring States period. Um, but rather, Noro says, this is more like late state feudalism. And, and, and it even bears, I think, some resemblance maybe to absolutism in France, where everything is um, you know, centralized under uh, this power, uh, this main central power, but it's still uh, based on feudal modes of production and social relations. So. Um, during the Tokugawa period, then the samurai and the daimyo get more and more in debt with moneylenders. And this is one important thing that leads to some important changes down the road. Um, meanwhile, the Tokugawa economy was still centered on agriculture and the exploitation of farmers. Uh, and this caused many, these peasant riots, then ikki, to continue, as well as for this lack of incentive there's a great lack of incentive for farmers then, um, and many abandon farming uh, for other professions such as commerce and move to the cities, for instance. But examples of large riots in this time in Tokugawa period would have been the Kurume riot, which involved 100 villages and 160,000 farmers, or the Kishu riot, which involved 230,000 farmers. And in this one, there were also many ronin samurai as well. This is very important, uh, as I'll talk about uh, in a minute. So the Bakufu tried to limit the amount of land that people could own, but this was not successful. And the samurai became more and more in debt to moneylenders who advanced them loans on their rice stipends. So samurai are paid in rice, in um, yearly rice stipends in barrels of rice or koku. Um, and this is based on their rank you know, how much koku they get, and then how big of a uh, household they can support based on that. Um, but the amount is fixed. It's determined and it's known. So this means it's very easy for money lenders uh, then to lend them uh, advance loans on their rice stipends. But it results um, in various different things, in the samurai becoming uh, greatly in debt, many of them. Um, and it also results in the breakdown of the theoretical four-tiered class structure of Shino Kosho, samurai farmers, uh, artisans, and merchants. Um, and in this class structure, based on traditional Confucian 
uh, class structure dating way back into Chinese history. Um, the samurai at the top in Japan were supposed to be at the top. Um, but in reality, um, you know, their economic and material circumstances uh, did not improve and actually got worse and worse, progressively worse. Um, and the farmers as well would have traditionally, you know, their role obviously as producers of all of the wealth under feudalism was recognized. And so they were, you know, greatly beautified by the ruling class. But of course, um, they were the most exploited class. There was also an increase in light manufacturing and uh, not a decrease, but a decrease in agriculture. And farmers even adopted light manufacturing like silk to stay afloat. Their livelihoods thus become more and more dominated by market imperatives in this way. So all the conditions were there for the end of feudalism and the transition to capitalism. Noto then recaps the inconsistencies or contradictions within the Japanese feudal structure. One, land ownership was the basis for feudal control, but this was separated from the actual owners um, who owned the land uh, on paper and actual rule of the land was relegated to overseers who were actually there. Um, and in addition, also many samurai don't even have land, they just receive stipends, uh, which is transformed into debt later on. Second was the exploitation of producers, which led to conflict between landowners and the ruling classes on the one hand and peasants on the other. And when taxes were too oppressive, farmers would ditch their fields and run away from the village. This resulted in A, a decline in agricultural produce, and the, which was the basis for feudal control and wealth, and B, a growing urban population of wage laborers, or an urban proletariat. And thirdly was increasing commercialization. So all of these things helped to undermine the Japanese feudal structure. Yet, these groups did not come together to overthrow the system, and in fact, many of those groups lacked a clear political focus. Farmers were concerned with debt relief uh, and famine, not with changing the entire system, while merchants, too, did not make political claims. But there was one group which was forced to make a political claim, and this was the samurai, um, because they were basically, in effect, public servants. So their claims were political and infected the, affected the entire system. If they fell into economic hardship and started to demand change, this has great political repercussions. So the conditions for capitalism were in place, and Noto says the spark that lit the flame was interaction with European capitalism. And interestingly, interestingly in this regard, Noto focuses on um, popular slogans from the uh, uh, late Tokugawa period, such as revere the emperor, expel the barbarians, son no joi. And this was provided um, uh, this provided, he says, a rally point for various groups, such as farmers, merchants, and samurai, who were all dissatisfied with Tokugawa feudalism. Now, this slogan is frequently picked up in histories of Japan today as evidence of kind of early nationalism, proto-nationalism, and so Meiji Restoration is seen as kind of this nationalist, exclusivist, uh, exclusionist kind of, um, or even reactionary movement. But Noto says this is not totally the case um, because it was, the idea of expel the barbarians was also used to challenge the Tokugawa legitimacy of controlling outside contact, right? All outside contact, trade and whatnot, was all had to go through Tokugawa. They controlled it all. This is what the Sakokure, the closed uh, country kind of laws and regulations were all about so that individual kingdoms or daimyo and individual regions couldn't establish their own um, international relations and get powerful through trade and challenge the power of the Tokugawa, right? Um, so in a sense, even though you know this provided kind of this totem pole for different groups to rally around, um, it doesn't necessarily mean that um, groups were using it for a very nationalistic um, or kind of reactionary purposes. But there were reactionary elements, of course, within the Meiji Restoration that were still predicated and emerged out of feudalism. And this was the aristocracy, 
and many members of the samurai and the samurai class and the emperor. So these groups led the restoration and they implemented capitalism to get rid of feudal modes of production, but not feudalism altogether. Okay, um, they eliminated the feudal class system and implemented private property instead. This was the last impediment to taking the means and modes of production away from individual producers. So they didn't do totally do away with feudalism. More, uh, moreover, they maintained their ruling class leadership while masking it behind the language of individual freedom. This feudal structure has in inhibited the formation of class consciousness today, says Noto, speaking from his time um, in pre-World War II, right? But what's important here, and I'll talk about this more in a minute, is that you know all of the land under feudalism in Japan up until this time was, in theory, just, it was all the basically the property of the emperor or the court, okay? And um, then it was kind of relegated, it was just ruled or looked over by, it was, it was on, on lease, you know, um, from the court and it was um, the various daimyo and then the rulers were just kind of taking care of it, right? They were overseeing it in, in theory, right? Um, and then in, in actual practice, the farmers themselves are basically functioning as independent producers um, so it's basically their land. Um, and moreover, they have um, the commons, which I'll touch on in a minute, which is, you know, wilderness and mountain, uh, mountainous areas, uh, forests, etc., which they can then go into and acquire the necessary other goods for to maintain their livelihood, such as uh, wood, for instance, to build all kinds of things or uh, to make, you know, to fire their, heat their homes and, and whatnot. Um, but all of that, what used to be this kind of individually owned um, or communally owned, is all eliminated. And it all becomes then the, the lords who are just ruling over the emperor's land. Now that land, most of it, becomes their actual private property. And then the farmers and peasants themselves are cut off from the commons, access to the commons, and kicked off in many cases through different kinds of primitive accumulation, their farmland. Okay, so the former aristocracy, the kazoku, or peerage, uh, the former aristocracy becomes the kazoku, or peerage, in this system, while the samurai become the shizoku. Um, previously, the aristocracy received stipends called kadoku, but these were eliminated and replaced with one-time huge lump-sum payments of government bonds, or kousai. So this turned the former ruling class into the contemporary capitalist class. And this was, for the capitalists, um, along with private property, as I just mentioned, uh, and control of the means of production, it was also provided them this big kind of um, uh, input of capital, then which then they can use to invest and to increase further. Moreover, um, all of the debt formerly held by the domains, or Han, um, was taken by the new government and repaid as government bonds to creditors or uh, money lenders. Um, so, uh, in other words, then this also gives a big boost of capital uh, to the new government, which it can use to invest in uh, these big infrastructure projects. Moreover, the ruling class continued to own land while the rest of the population and many samurai were forced to become tenant farmers or wage laborers. And there were 486 kazoku uh, families. Um, so the old aristocracy aristocracy was transformed into the new capitalist class, and they also formed an oligarchy on political power. Um, Noto then looks at the importance of Meiji land reforms. The main one was, as I mentioned, private property, but another one was fixed taxes rather than based on yield of agricultural production. So this had major implications for farmers if in the case of a poor harvest, for example. Um, and also, thirdly, Taxes were paid now in money and not in rice. So the original public loans to the old aristocracy, land ownership, private property, and the abolishment of public land and monetary taxes, etc., all aided the new capitalist class. Why? Because average farmers couldn't pay taxes since they had no money savings. So they had to yield the means of production, uh, such as their farms, their farmland, to rich landowners, who then paid them wages in return to farm that land, which was 
in many cases often originally theirs anyway. So this is precisely the definition, basically one of the definitions of primitive accumulation uh, put forward by Marx. And as evidence of this, Noto points to the huge number of land sales and mortgages, which increased dramatically from this time, as well as the large amount of loans taken out. Prices of agricultural goods at this time were generally high, um, and fixed taxes, which were hard to pay, led to more centralization. And Noto points, cites an interesting, uh, some interesting data that shows that the number of people with voting rights under the new Meiji constitution who receive voting rights, and this was people who paid between 5 to 10 yen in land taxes, quite large amounts, so it was people who owned quite a bit of land. This number of people with the right to vote actually went down between Meiji 17 and Meiji 19. In other words, it was, you know, people lost access to, uh, to their land that they had previously held, even, even in some cases, you know, fairly large amounts of land. So this is showing this increased centralization and just how hard it was for many people to pay taxes at this time. And then, of course, uh, the number of tenant farmers rose. So in some prefectures, the amount, about 38 to 39 percent of farmland was all tenant farmed. And this greatly increased throughout the Meiji period. But in addition to tenant farming, many people were just simply driven off the land and forced into the city. They can't pay their taxes, they don't have any money, or the lords just kick them off directly once um, it you know, becomes the private property of uh, the former rulers. So people were driven off their lands, forced into the city, and now they form the new basis for um, the industrial proletariat and, and wage labor. As I mentioned, people also lost the right to, rights to the commons, um, or EDI-chi or EDI-ken, uh, as the commons is called in Japanese. Um, so in a way, the Tokugawa period was actually better for average people because at least it guaranteed a right to land. And in the beginning of this class, I asked the question, has capitalism made things better? And many people um, today have are under the impression that, you know, things are generally getting better, right? And because we have all this technology, things are supposed to be getting more convenient. And, um, you know, just in, in every way, we're led to believe that things are getting better. But it's basically accepted fact amongst historians of Japan uh, that at least at this time, um, things did not get better for average people. So Noto says Meiji wasn't really much of a revolution, um, and he blamed this on the particularities of land ownership in Japan, but I would point out that it in fact has more commonalities, I think, than he realizes with other places, uh, including England, as we've seen in uh, Ellen Mason's uh, Wood, uh, or her Origin of Capitalism, right? Um, he says... Japanese farmers today, in his time, were still somewhere between tenant and agricultural laborers, um, but wages were too low to rely just on farming, so farmers had to supplement their incomes with other waged work. Now, this is something that we definitely see happening in this period, and you can even see remnants of it today. If you go to many old Japanese farmhouses, um, there will frequently be uh, additional buildings that were built during this time for, for instance, uh, cultivating silk. Um, because silk was a major export of Japan at this time, and farm families could no longer support themselves just with agriculture, so they had to rely on commodity production for the global market, which is determined, of course, by market imperatives, and which itself is a form of wage labor. Moreover, when there was a surplus, prices an agricultural surplus, prices and wages dropped, um, right? Because they get less money for uh, their agricultural produce. But on the other hand, when there was a poor harvest, there was high demand, but not enough produce left for farmers. So they're stuck between a rock and a hard place. And Meiji just brought farmers, in Noto's words, the worst of both worlds. <laughs> 
Noto also says that Japanese farmers were more morally conservative than Western farmers, but were also more oppressed, so that both of these factors made them more revolutionary, either toward fascism or proletariat revolution. This is his view. So, in any case, the Meiji Restoration created just enough of the right kind of, quote, freedom for capitalism to flourish, because ideas of capitalism and liberalism are based on um, notions of freedom, um, specific notions, which generally include something like uh, what happened in Japan, which was one, freedom of movement, and two, freedom to change jobs. This was important not just for peasants, but for the former aristocracy themselves, because now they could engage in industry, and this enabled the rise of an urban proletariat drawn from dispossessed farmers. As well as three, perhaps the most important kind of freedom under liberal capitalism, quote freedom, which is the freedom to sell one's labor for a wage, uh, or in other words, the wage relationship. And this is you know, frequently uh, identified as the origin of capitalism. So Noto then looks at the Industrial Revolution in Japan. Um, and what shape that took. Well, the Meiji government established the Kobusho uh, and built modern factories with imported Western technology. This was all done and financed with um, land tax money, basically. And the government, the Kobusho, operated these uh, factories, in many cases, at a loss. Um, but that wasn't the point. The point wasn't for them personally to make profit. It was to get this in, to use that capital investment to, to get the infrastructure in place for further capital accumulation. And in this sense, it was a, high, a huge success because they sold off all those industries much later uh, very cheaply to large private enterprises or people who would go on to establish large private enterprises. The Meiji government also set up the Kozan Kyoku or mining agency and nationalized major mines. Then from Meiji 18 to Meiji 22, they sold off these mines to Mitsui, Mitsubishi, and Fujita. And these are all common household names today. The origins of much of their wealth uh, come from not only the fact that many of them were former aristocracy who got huge lump sum payments of all of their um, you know, stipends uh, put together, but also um, received much of this uh, newly emerging industry, and, and so important for heavy industry, of course, was mines. The government also established transport, finance, and telecommunications infrastructure to facilitate capital accumulation. And in 1869, it set up the Ministry of Commerce, or Tsu Shoshi, which operated exchange companies for finance, shipping, uh, and shipping companies for transportation. The government cooperated with rich elites in port cities to establish and operate these companies. The government also set up banks, railroads, and cooperated with private sector for this. At least, so, for example, at least ships uh, from Mitsubishi and gives, gave Mitsubishi funds and support uh, to build these ships. The government gave financial support and other transport companies uh, to other transport companies and shipbuilders too, not to mention support for a wide range of other industries, including silk, cement, and glass. Um, so. Many people had, you know, some people today have um, a theory of an idea of um, capitalist, you know, the capitalist, quote, free market um, and the invisible hand of the market, wherein government control or what they would say uh, has interfered, what they would call interference is detrimental for cap the capitalist a free market, right? But this is a complete fiction. Um, because capitalism from the very start, uh, if you read any history at all, uh, it is plainly uh, evident that capitalism from the very start has relied on state support. They've both gone hand in hand. And in many cases, as we're seeing in the case of Japan, the political ruling elite is uh, the, the capitalist elite as well. You know, they're one and the same. But 
what Noto is really concerned with, uh, what he wants to point out, is you know where much of the, the wealth was accumulated, the wealth under Japanese capitalism was first accumulated. And as we'll see in the cases of China and India as well, it came not through heavy industry, which did, was basically non-existent in Japan at the time, but through light industry and the production of a special single, um, you know, single commodities or cash crops um, ba that came from very labor-intensive industries. So in other words, um, the cap the, this big capital accumulation, capital buildup um, early on in Japanese capitalism came from um, from it was all variable capital. It was highly exploited uh, labor. Um, and this was most apparent in light manufacturing. Um, so the biggest factor in establishing Japanese capitalism was how already established industries like handicraft and handicrafts like silk, dyes, and pottery, etc., which were already there at the time of Bakumatsu, and how these were really picked up on and revolutionized and mechanized just the right amount um, to through labor-intensive means to really build up capital. Um, because Japan did not have a tariff, did not have tariff protection, and because overseas capital was monopoly capital, uh, Japanese companies too had to form cartels and trusts to compete. So, for instance, in Meiji 13, there was the formation of the Paper Manufacturers Guild, the Seishi Dengo Kai. In Meiji 15, the Spinning Guild, uh, spinning in this case is Boseki. And also beer, fa uh, beer manufacturers merged into three large companies, and they eventually grew large enough to uh, export uh, their produce. And in Meiji 39, they formed one mega corporation. Similarly, in, in Meiji 36, um, three hemp makers joined to, into one mega trust with 85% of shares. So light industry is often overlooked in the face of heavy industry giants such as Mitsui or Mitsubishi, etc. But light industry is argu was arguably more important because traditional handicrafts were totally replaced with new machinery, and this separated workers from the modes or means of production, as well as created an unskilled surplus wage labor force. At the same time, much still continued, much of this continued to be made by hand at starvation prices and wages. So this kind of labor intensive industry was the prime conditions, is the prime conditions for extracting high surplus value. In other words, it has a high ratio of variable to uh, constant capital, while accumulation eventually allowed for the gradual incorporation of new machines and transition from labor to capital intensive production. So as Noto says, feudal handicrafts were transformed into capital enterprise, and this was fueled by high demand for these products such as silk and cotton from abroad. This demand for light labor and handicrafts produced in factories was met by a relative surplus population of dispossessed farmers, as we've just seen. So this is the, pro the process of the origins of capital, the introduction of capitalism, is this transformed social relations and agricultural production, and farmers are dispossessed from their lands, and then they form the new industrial proletariat, working in factories for a wage. So Noto, um, he highlights some data from silk reeling factories from Meiji 26 uh, and Meiji 29. And these are a little bit hard to tell what's going on here. I, I put these into a graph. Um, light blue indicates machine, silk that's produced mainly by machine, whereas um, dark blue indicates by hand, by hand loom, for instance. Um, and I just want to point out a few things here first. Most of the light industry production is being produced in small factories at this time with less than 10 uh, people. But this changes, um, or between, I should sorry to say, between 10 to 50 people. But this changes, um, uh, gradually changes to factories becoming larger and employing more hands um, to greater than 50, for example, or, or, or uh, people for instance, between 50 and 100 people. Um, and at the same time, much is done by this you know, newly imported technology, machine technology. It's, um, it's a minimal amount of technology, um, but 
interestingly, what happens is that as um, things become more centralized into a bit larger, to fewer larger factories, um, and the number of people employed working goes up, so there's higher variable capital, there's actually a decrease in constant capital in the total number of machine um, produced uh, silk. So there's an idea, you know, again, of new technology is just constantly progressing, right? But this is not always the case. In many cases, capitalists will uh, purposely not advance technology or even choose lower modes of technology because they're only concerned about the ratio of constant to variable capital and the rate of surplus value. Also, another point I want to look at is, you know, the power sources for silk reeling factories in these uh, two years and, um, you know, at first a lot is produced by manpower, but there's a gradual shift, uh, decrease in manpower and increase in steam and coal power. And this is just important, you know, indicating um, the uh, rise of fossil fuels and what Andreas Malm would call uh, fossil capital. Um, so much of this, a little bit of this here is just... Um, uh, repeat of what I just said, but um, you know, in Meiji 26, most people were employed in small factories between 10 and 50 people. Um, it was more machine operated than hand loom, and the power source was mostly by hand, but then there was a gradual shift um, to steam power. And note that while the total number of factories went down, while the total machine operated plants also did not mu rise much or declined, and as I mentioned, this could be attributable to Marx's discussion of the ideal rate of surplus value and the ratio between variable and constant capital, as well as the increasing centralization into larger factories and companies. The most uh, grueling labor then was done by women and children overproducing cheap goods in sweatshop conditions. And we'll look at this aspect in more detail in our next uh, lecture. There were some efforts to monitor this, such as a study undertaken and a uh, survey undertaken in Meiji 17, um, but there was no real impact or policies, labor policies enacted to protect workers. Um, other industries at this time were in competition with Western companies, uh, for example, in uh, terms of commodities such as cotton, beer, and hemp, and they underwent similar changes as we're seeing in silk and uh, cotton. Um, and they had to import tech and consolidate industries earlier to compete. Banking and finance developed and supported the industries in tandem with this, and it was assisted by the production of fiat money, or fukan uh, um, uh, shihei, uh, silver conversion, and uh, lowering interest rates. Spinning and weaving were at the center of these changes. They were quite a very you know, underdeveloped uh, industries prior to Meiji, but then the government, as I've shown, um, supported the introduction of new technology, building factories, and so there's a big increase in this um, during the Meiji period. Along with silk, another a key export commodity for Japan that allowed um, capitalists to build up a lot of wealth was a cotton yarn production. And Noto highlights data on this uh, from the years between 1882 to 1902. So over a 20 year period, and we can see um, just this exponential growth, even in the number of factories, um, but workers, spindles uh, operating, and then total yarn output, which increases exponentially during this time. Japan went from an importer to a major exporter of cotton yarn um, and Noto says that cotton was one of the most capitalistic enterprises in Japan. Other light industry also developed in a similar way. Um, so the, not just the Meiji Revolution, but also the Industrial Mev Revolution, Noto says, was basically then complete around the time of the Russo-Japanese War around 1903 and 1904. And this was where there was a first major shift in modes of production um, from light industry to heavy industry. And this really occurred, Noto says, around World War, t uh, World War I. Um, okay. Noto then looks 
analyzes the total social capital um, from the years Meiji 17 to Meiji 36 and showed how there was a great increase across all various industries. So capital is growing throughout these new industries, right? Indicating that Japan has become a um, major capitalist player, that capitalism has been adopted in Japan, that surplus value is being extracted through these labor-intensive means. And that the industries where capital increased the most was industry, including light industry and manufacturing, as we've seen, and transport. Moreover, since Japan was a late developed capitalist country, it had huge revolutionary changes in accumulation over a short period of time. So these effects were very dramatic. These changes were very, um, they completely transformed people's uh, lives and the exploitation as well um, was uh, quite intense. Whereas advanced capitalist countries like England, um, their capital and savings uh, had built up alongside industry over long periods of time, in some cases over a century or two. And in Japan's case, he says, capital accumulation was the result of land reform, government bonds, and tax revenues, and much of this was extracted forcefully. Um, and this propelled the former ruling class to the new capitalist class. And here is uh, just a breakdown of this total social uh, composite capital uh, between various fields in, uh, from the years 1884 to 1903. In 1884, banks had most of the total social capital, about 75-76%, but this quickly spread out so that in 1889, um, uh, this spinning and weaving in industry um, now holds 25%, um, and in 1894, transport, especially uh, especially rail, um, held 32% of total social capital. And so this spreads out from the banks to industries um, and transportation especially. Prior to the Russo-Japanese War, there were big fluctuations in you know, how total social capital was spread out, but afterward, the amount of capital in various fields settled down um, and the total social capital increased with a shift from light to heavy industry and manufacturing, meaning heavy industry um, held a greater portion of total capital than light. And this all happened in late Meiji. In 1897, Japan adopted the gold standard. And in 1899, it got rid of extraterritoriality, Chigai Hoken. In 1910, it gained the right to impose tariffs. So with all of these things happening, the, um, you know, total social capital becomes more spread out. There's a shift from light to heavy industry. Um, and, and Japan joins the gold standard, imposes tariffs, etc. So by the end of the Japanese war, says Noto, Japan has become a global capitalist power. Um, and he also cites a rise in manufacturing exports and raw material imports as evidence of this. So the Japanese Industrial Revolution was a result of revolutionary changes uh, along with the accompanying the Meiji Restoration and the import of new technology fostered by new government um, and it was uh, also a product of the fact that developed capitalist nations had already gone through uh, the development of liberalism toward imperialist monopoly capitalism. Um, take a little drink here, my throat's getting a bit dry. Um, <clears throat> but Noto highlights uh, problems. Uh, there are many problems with this, of course, but um, you know, as I mentioned in an earlier slide, things did not really improve for average people, and especially for many people, farmers, they got worse in many cases, okay? So in agriculture, there were few advances actually made in this time. They're still using, most farmers and peasants are still using the same methods, harvesting methods that they did under feudalism. But what did change, and this is the biggest thing, was the ownership of the means of production, of the land, which totally switched from a feudal system to one of private property and capitalist modes of production and social relations, such as wage labor, rent, and market imperatives. And this was a major contradiction of Japanese capitalist development, of capitalist development in general, which would create 
inescapable conflict. In the case of Japan, this was evidenced uh, early on in the case of many peasant and farmer re rebellions and riots between 1873 and 1885 especially. They frequently joined with disaffected low-ranking samurai who had lost their hereditary stipends, karoku, and political privileges. Now, this is a repeat, basically, of what happened already during the first, you know, during the Meiji Restoration in 1868. Uh, disaffected samurai um, join with other groups, right? Well, this is happening uh, again because many of these key issues uh, were not solved. And at first, this was unfocused rebellions against Meiji reforms, but by 1877, it had split into three different uh, directions. And one um, uh, area of opposition was aimed at the tyranny of wealthy landowners and capitalists employed by them or who rented their land. The second was aimed at wealthy landowners and or money lenders who charged high interest on debt. And the third was tenant farmers who protested high extractions of their harvests and crops, especially when in the case of poor harvests. So the second and third groups um, especially, um, you know, came to uh, their discontent came to a head around 1884 with large rebellions starting at Ibaraki Izu and culminating uh, in the Chichibu uh, Rebellion. And they also spread around Gunma and Nagano. But these last two groups at the same time didn't have a lot of political power. Again, they're the weakest in society, um, or they have the lowest kind of position in society, um, and so they didn't have much political effect. Uh, but type one did, um, and it, it culminated in the freedom and popular rights movement and the formation of the Jiuto, the liberal party, as well as they're centralized around the demand for political enfranchisement. Now, tenant farmers had nearly 50 to 60 percent of their harvest taken, regardless of total crop harvest uh, differences per year. These landowners were the largest capitalists and industrialists who paid a percent of tax, chiso, based on the total value of their land, but this was relatively a low amount, and this allowed them to offset their risk entirely onto tenant farmers. On top of this, crop prices remained low throughout the Meiji period, and this was made worse by the progress of industri the Industrial Revolution and transition to inconvertible paper money, fukan shihei. And because standards of living were still low for most people, and because the population of cities were still not very large vis-a-vis -vis the country, especially in early Meiji, there was little demand uh, for lots of rice, grain, and stable foods, etc., right? As the urban there's more and more demand as the urban population grows, but at the beginning, when the urban population is still not, when it's still low, right, there's, there's not a huge demand still at this point for agricultural uh, food products. And in, also many in agriculture in the country had not yet fully made the switch to a money economy, whereas commercial capital already had done this. So it was very easy for commercial capital or shogyo or shihon to exploit agriculture, uh, for instance, by buying up lots of poor people's lands. And most of the biggest capitalists as um, I've already pointed out, were former daimyo or upper echelon samurai who had their formerly public holdings turned into private property and held tons of new government bonds and most of the national wealth. So again, the old ruling class was turned into the new capitalist class and continued ruling over the same people, sometimes in even harsher ways and with the support of the new state. And Noto then looks at the resulting bourgeois politics that emerged from this. So capitalist development was the hardest on farmers who were driven from their traditional lands, whereas landlords kept their land and part got to participate in local politics, such as prefectural or assembly, uh, city assembly members. Disaffected samurai and displaced farmers um, led the freedom and popular rights movement, the Jiu Minken Undo. This means that... Um, Japan's first liberal movement originated not in the city, but in the countryside. And this is also important when we consider Ellen Megson Wood's argument, um, you know, of considering the nature of 
so-called bourgeois um, revolutions, right? Um, that, you know, these things didn't emerge from a bourgeois class, uh, which was highly urbanized. No, they emerged in the countryside. Um, but at the same time, this movement was, says Noto, unsuccessful. So while the bourgeoisie uh, took power, they never really adopted liberalism as other advanced capital capitalist nations had. And it was the largest landowners who were turned into the capitalist class. So eventually the Giuto, the uh, liberal party, split was split between those who wanted to represent farmers and moderates who represented landowning and capitalist classes. In 1884, the Giuto dissolved, and the moderate reformists uh, from this party helped bring the land-owning class and new capitalist class together. Th their power was solidified under the new Meiji constitution and the diet, which made private property sacrosanct. So from the beginning, the, the liberal party was you know, conflicted to the extent that it really wanted to represent farmers and average people in the first place. The diet, or shugin, only represented those who paid over 15 yen now in national taxes, or landowners, and this number of people actually decreased over the next two years from 450,000 to 420,000, as we've seen. <laughs> On top of the 16 wealthy landowners, uh, capitalists from each prefecture, totaling 660 people, joined the aristocracy as members of the House of Peers, or Kizokuin. When the Jiuto revived in 1890 now it when it was uh when it came came back after this it was simply a party of the ruling classes um and they didn't even need political power really just in noto's words all they needed was the freedom to exploit um there was also a massive population shift from the country to the city this led to a growing demand for rice um, and around late Meiji, after the Russo-Japanese War, Japanese, Japan uh, went from a rice exporter to a rice importer, and the prices of rice uh, rose throughout this time, as you can see. Um, you know, between 1883 and 1887, um, <clears throat> uh, 5 yen, 17 sen, and then this goes up 6, 9, 12, like this, uh, between the years 1897 and 1902. And keep in mind, as rice prices rise, this would this is a key commodity, so it would drive up other the prices of other goods as well. Yet this didn't make tenant farmers richer because all the profit was taken by landowners. Landowners benefited doubly from rising rice prices because they could get more money from Nengu when rice was converted into money, and also they could charge more for rent too. So it led to what Noto identified as capitalist landowners, or shihonka uh, jinushi. And you know, note also here a that a rise in prices uh, due, was due to the f fact that less, uh, there was less technical advancement in agriculture, um, and the capitalist landlords benefited more from surplus value with a low um, constant to variable capital ratio. Fewer tenant farmers, variable capital, working harder than ever with low overhead costs of so constant capital equal, uh, equaled huge surplus value for the capitalist landowners. Uh, later, the Jiuto became the Seiyukai, led by Ito Hirobumi, while the Kaishinto and Shimpoto became the Kokuminto. Uh, also, Sayonji, uh, Kimochi, and Katsuda, and others... Um, were important political uh, figures at this time, but Noto says they're basically puppets of the big capitalists. Okay, so moving on then to summary and Noto's summary and conclusions. And actually, there's more of the book after this um, and, and additional writings by him. Again, there's seven volumes um, eventually um, in his lecture series, for instance. And I'm only just looking at portions of, um, you know, some of the first portions here. Um, but conclusion, but he can already draw many summaries and conclusions. So, um, because Japan was a late, uh, capitalist developer, it couldn't allow actual free competition domestically, let alone political and economic freedom, right? We've seen this with 
there's lots of state control and the state plays an active role in setting up capitalism and establishing capitalism. Moreover, Japanese capitalism moved at a very rapid speed to accumulate and to, quote, catch up with the West as, and to compete with Western companies. Japanese companies form cartels and trusts, etc. This doesn't mean that Japan moved to imperialism right away, but it was something um, Japanese monopoly capital couldn't ignore either. They didn't really have a choice. It's, since they're a latecomer to capitalism, it would be too difficult for a bunch of you know, small um, businesses to just compete on this huge scale. I mean, this is the age of um, you know, global imperialism still. Um, and also note that uh, the 1925 peace preservation law, Chian Ijiho, was aimed at suppressing workers and farmers' revolts. Um, so it's keeping you know, the real revolutionary um, uh, potential of the Meiji restoration, restoration um, it's kind of keeping a lid on it, right? So because Meiji oligarchs basically created the capitalist class and fostered capitalism in Japan, it emerged quickly rather than from a long process of struggle. And Noto, um, in his view, it thus remains incomplete. And this was all based on sudden and massive primitive accumulation. And also massive exploitation prepared the way for further, the further development um, by more uh, centralization and a move away from small producers. The commonality, and this has been repeated many times now, the commonality with pre-capitalist Japan is that the same bourgeois aristocracy, the same bourgeoisie, the aristocracy class, remained in power behind the oligarchy. And Japanese peasants and samurai fought together against them until recently. Um, some in the ruling class were especially uh, scared of peasant movements and of a new proletariat class consciousness emerging. So this would explain, for example, probably um, lots of the very harsh repression, for instance, uh, that arose uh, and, and that was aimed at suppressing workers and farmers' movements. Um, this is also partly why landlords and industrial commercial capitalists formed an alliance to protect their interests. So Noto says the next step um, is an would be an alliance between factory workers and farmers. Again, some of this is a bit dated. He's writing in the 1920s and 30s. But also he says that farmers could just as easily be swayed by fascism or nationalism, so there is some danger. Um, I mean, Yoshimi Yoshiaki has described grass grassroots fascism in Japan. Um, of course, you know, with extreme poverty and, and exploitation, um, many time um, average workers are left with no other place to turn than um, kind of, uh, you know, uh, than, than, na than nationalism uh, and things like that. So I think this is what Noto is trying to say is that, you know, farmers, especially and average workers, could be radicalized, he says, in the wrong direction, kind of. And I don't know, I mean, from hindsight, like, considering Japan's later involvement in the Asia-Pacific War um, and the support for nationalism and militarism at that time, um, it, it makes sense why he would say this, I think. Um, but it, it, I don't know, it's, it's, it's a hard... Uh, it's a hard call, you know. He's he's a little bit he's he's critical of um, farmers and peasants at the same time as um, he talks about their revolutionary potential, right? Um, and while Japanese capitalism was influenced by culture, race, history, etc., it was more affected by its partial imposition from imperialist capitalist powers abroad. Thus, Japanese capital capitalism is inseparable and even a result of global capitalist development. Well. This is pretty much, this last part especially, is undeniable, as we'll see in later talks as well. You know, um, and, oh, I had another page of conclusion. But um, as we'll see in later talks, the capitalism, um, you know, was implemented maybe in different ways in various different regions. But it was all subject to the same, it's all part of a broader global uh, system which imposes market imperatives on different communities, right, and forces them to adopt uh, capitalist social relations. So um, 
The period between 1868 and 1904 and 1905 was a period of primitive accumulation and centralization. Then after the Russo-Japanese War was the Consolidation Period, or Seiriki, which, during which there was more centralization and consolidation um, and more flexing of Japanese capital on a world stage. And this, says Noto, set the stage for imperialism. And it also completed the move from light to heavy industry, especially to shipbuilding. Um, and shipbuilding at this time especially basically equaled military might. By World War I, Japan, he says, had, quote, broken the balance between the advanced capitalist powers, implying that Japan also becomes an advanced capitalist power and imperialist power. This is kind of important because, you know, some people will say today, like, oh, even during World War II, um, Japan wasn't fully capitalist. And it wasn't until after World War II that, that Japan really became a, a global capitalist power. Well, I think this is clearly wrong and... Uh, you know, Noro Etaro uh, as well uh, is is saying, you know, that that's um, wrong as well, that Japan was already an advanced capitalist power by World War I. Yet Japanese capital was still fettered by inconsistencies and contradictions, which limited its expansion so that the state must eventually step in, resulting in some kind of state capitalism. But this still didn't rectify the inconsistencies. They became more like a tumor that one couldn't get rid of without destroying the other. And this involved a full reevaluation of Japanese politics, society, uh, and so forth. And the three main consistent inconsistencies which Noto uh, concludes with are the imbalance between the ability to acquire primitive accumulation and demands of heavy industry, and this pushed Japan to imperialism, the, to the imbalance between industrial power and modes of production, to be honest, actually, I, he, Noto doesn't go into a lot of detail at this point on some of these, so even I think they're a little bit unclear here. But uh, And then thirdly, he says, while Japan still lagged behind other advanced countries in terms of industrial product, productive technology, Japan still had high composition capital, i.e. companies were spending much uh, money on constant capital in proportion to variable capital. However, this naturally results in a falling rate of profit. And this gets a, a bit complicated here, but um, Japan had a lot of capital to, um, but it, it was eventually limited in how much of that it could invest in uh, constant capital. Um, and at the same time, um, you know, as Marx would say, um, uh, as constant capital grows in proportion to variable capital, this does result in a falling rate of profit. Um, I don't know if Noto is saying that that in itself is going to lead to the demise of capitalism. I'm not sure. I mean, this is a complex debate, and, and Noto doesn't really specify this, but he identifies it anyway as obviously uh, an, an inconsistency. Um and he predicts that this will result in total capital centralization with huge accumulation, but a falling rate of profit and monopoly capital. Um, for example, the formation of huge trusts in finance and a simultaneous result of fascist politics, i.e. centralized power. And this is, I think, a quite you know, uh, accurate uh, prediction on his part, writing still before the Asia-Pacific War at this point, um, you know, how monopoly capital, how centralization um, does, you know, basically uh, complement forms of authoritarian or, or even fascist politics. Yeah. Okay. Um, so that is the end of uh, my talk today. Uh, I hope you found this uh, kind of in-depth discussion of a, a one um kind of understudied uh, pre-war Japanese Marxist economist to uh, be valuable and interesting. But what I really wanted to highlight through his work uh, are some key points as well, some key observation that, observations that he makes uh, about the introduction of capitalism to Japan, because there are um, points in his analysis, as we will see in later lectures, that overlap and coincide or, or bear similarity to 
um, the introduction of capital in other places such as a capitalism uh, in other places such as India and uh, China. Okay, so thank you very much for listening.